All right, so we are now recording. The webinar is live, but we're not beginning yet. So just for all those of you who are joining, just bear with us while we allow folks to log in, get in, find us on this Zoom webinar. We are excited to be here with you all today. It's a, it's a beautiful day to be talking about pollinators, don't you think? And pollinator gardens, good time of year to be working in the garden too. We will get started momentarily. Let's go give a couple more, another minute for some folks to join here and then we'll be getting started. Clock says 12.01, we will begin. And don't worry for all those who may join a few minutes late, this is being recorded and will be shared widely. So if you missed the beginning or any part of it, you can always come back and if you wanted to take better notes and hear anything again, just watch the recording, which will be emailed out tomorrow. And because we are recording it, it will be widely available on our YouTube channel, as well as a link in our email and our social media. We'll go ahead and get started, even though people are still joining. So thank you all for being here today. My name is Jeffrey Berry. I am the CEO of Tennessee Environmental Council, and we are presenting today's webinar about how to build, maintain, and understand your pollinator garden and how to, how to care for it throughout the year how to identify the plants. And I don't wanna steal any thunder because uh, if you just stay with us here, we will go through our, a full presentation uh, joined by Monica Pretz, who is our garden field volunteer coordinator and Gwendolyn Blanton, which is our program coordinator for the pollinator program, which we will be talking about now. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, get into our slide presentation and get started. By the way, our pollinator program is called Generate Some Buzz. But as you know, as an allusion to the buzz of a bee, but pollinators are not just bees, uh, as, as we all know. So welcome to Generate Some Buzz. Tennessee Environmental Council is uh, an organization, a nonprofit, a statewide nonprofit founded in 1970. Our mission is helping people and communities improve our environment. Our vision, what are we working toward in a, an improved environment is, includes thriving habitats, a circular economy and climate balance in Tennessee. So we've created a number of programs for you to get involved towards those aspira aspirational goals. The Tennessee Tree Program, Watershed Support, Generate Some Buzz, which we're talking about today, Recycle Tennessee, Compost Your Compost, our zero, educa zero Waste Education Program, and more. So make sure you check out our website to learn more about those programs and how to get involved in making a difference in every aspect of your life. Because everything we do makes a difference, and that is what is required to solve the great environmental challenges of our days for our involvement in that. The, one we're, the, the challenge we're talking about today is the decline in pollinator insects globally. And... Most of you probably already know that pollinator insects, the butterflies and the bees that pollinate our plants worldwide have been declining for decades uh, significantly. And the monarchs were almost on the threatened list because, or they were, um, they were going endangered, but they seem to be making a slight rebound perhaps because people, more people are building habitats. But um, we can do something about that. We can reverse the pollinator decline or at least do our part in creating habitat for these essential insects because they do pollinate more than 75% of all flowering plants worldwide. So think of all the food and plants globally that are being supported that could not exist without pollinator insects. It's a, it's a global interconnected web. And we can make a difference in that for ecological health and feeding our future. 
So Tennessee Environment Council, in order to create programs that are more accessible for people to get involved in these solutions and make it easy and fun for people, we created this program, Generate Some Buzz, our pollinator program, in 2019. That's when we launched it. And we're really pleased how well um, it has worked and people uh, that have signed up to participate. The whole point of this program is to show everybody that we can do our part in starting our own pollinator gardens at home in the community. This program is supported by NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service and USDA. Those were the seed grants that got us started. And TVA has provided a lot of support to allow us to expand our program. And we have numerous other sponsors as well. Now, how do you build a garden? We're gonna go briefly over the basics. Uh, we have three techniques that we recommend that we use. And the, the goal of this technique is to remove as much of the weed and seed bank as possible from the surface um, so that the pollinators we want to grow, the plants that we want to grow that support and feed our pollinator species and insects and such, that they, uh, there's less competition for that. And we will show you more about this later. But you can build by hand, dig out the sod by hand, remove it, get it out of there, put it in the corner of your yard. You can use a machine, a sod cutter, or if you're really doing a larger plot, we recommend the skid steer. Uh, but you can do it by hand the whole thing. It depends on how many people you have and how much energy you got. This is the first garden I planted in the bottom left in my front yard, my pollinator garden about four years ago. And it helped inspire the first of this program. Um, but you can create a garden of any size from a window garden, a window box up to thousands of square feet or into the acres even. But since we've launched this program in 2019, we have over 978 participants that have planted gardens at their homes across Tennessee, totaling over 148,000 square feet of pollinator habitat. That's new habitat that's been created in the last three years, thanks to your, your efforts and joining the program. So that pollinator garden I did in the lower left corner there, uh, that's the before picture. That's when I carved it out by hand. That's my spade in the, in the photo. And then that's what it looked like a couple months later that same year. I was so pleased and excited that I uh, was able to create some beauty, take some lawn and create a beautiful flower garden that has more ecological diversity. So I'm gonna scroll through some of the more recent gardens, the larger gardens we've created as an organization with crews of volunteers. This one is in the city of Lebanon that the city of Lebanon approved using some of their land. Hopefully this is just the first of many. And this garden was sponsored by Royal Cannon who uh, helped pay for the cost of building the garden, plus sent a crew of volunteers out there on a blustery day where it was snowing and sleeting, but we built that 2000 plus square foot garden back in April this year. This is a 200 square foot garden built by SSMV. They designed, they found the location, they got permission from the landowner to carve this garden. And that's what it looked like when it was planted in April. And those, some of the students there are with the School for Science and Math at Vanderbilt, SSMV. Um, but this is what it looks like this spring from, from planting it to growing. And this is the vision right here. I want to show you some before and after photos because this is the transformation from lawn to habitat that we are encouraging you to do. This is Stratford STEM where we had corporate teams from HCA, Amazon, Dell, UBS, and numerous community volunteers, city service mission, which is a volunteer organization. This is before they got to work on that day in October last fall, uh, sod removed and replaced with topsoil that we purchased and seeds from Roundstone, the key partner in this whole effort. And that was, that was done in about three hours, by the way, maybe four. Actually, it was a six hour work day, it's getting longer. But this is the garden yesterday. I took this photo yesterday. And so the flowers are growing. It looks a bit wild, but that's what a habitat looks like, especially at first. And this is just next to that garden, the long view under the power lines of Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA power lines. We want to see these hab habitats go on as far as the eye can see. But this is all at the Stratford Stam campus, high school in East Nashville. And this is the anchor garden, we call it, on Stratford Stam campus. 
If you walk down Porter Avenue at Stratford, you will see this uh, right before you go back into the residential zone. And this is, I think, my favorite garden of all those that we've planted so far, other than the ones in my front and backyard. Why I like this one is because it has the most robust growth that we've seen, the most, uh, most uh, flat, most diverse um, the balanced diversity of the species have grown and are flowering now. So it's a beautiful garden. And so this is our Cornelia Fort Trailhead project in the Shelby Bottoms Greenway and Nature Park. Corporate teams there included Flightview, Cummins, Beam Suntory, and numerous community volunteers. This is the lawn, the grass before we got started. This is after the volunteer day when we removed the sod and replaced it with topsoil. This one is about a 3,500 square foot garden. With We left that grass in the middle so people could walk out and enjoy the garden. And I'm gonna flip around and do a review, reverse view here to show what has become one of the more per perplexing aspects in our view of planting these gardens is they don't always grow at the rate we hope or would like them to. And, um, but before I show that, here's our, here's a close up of the flowers that I took yesterday. So yes, they are flowering at the Cornelia Fort Gardens as well. But this is where I was talking about. There's our walkway in the middle, our pathway. And on the left, you can see this robust growth. And on the right, it's sparse growth. There is growth and there's a lot of stuff growing in there, but it's, it's a clear difference and it's mysterious because we planted this thing on the same day. So the climate conditions were the same. The day was the same. The soil was installed. It was the same soil mix across the whole garden, the same seed mix across the whole thing. And yet half of it is doing super well and the other half is taking its time. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that here as I introduce Monica. Pretz, um, the field volunteer coordinator uh, for these gardens, and explain some of uh, the growth patterns of these gardens. Um, and also to remind you, if you're feeling a little bit underwhelmed by the progress of your garden at this point, uh, don't despair. If you, if you look real close, you'll probably see things growing and, and just give them the time they need to, uh, to reach maturity. I'm not gonna steal the thunder from Monica, and she will explain more about what we're talking about in her portion of the presentation. So Monica, take it away. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. So I'm gonna talk about the pollinator habitat, how we establish it a little bit more detailed than Jeffrey did. And then I will move on to the uh, basic white flower identifications. And I'll talk a little bit about the pollinators and the birds that they bring into our gardens. Can you next slide, please, Jeff? But before I start, I want to quickly introduce you some, to some terms that we use. So all of our gardens, we plant herbaceous plants, which means these plants are non-woody plants. So the above ground growth will largely or totally die back for the winter time. Herbaceous plants uh, can be in three different groups. Annual plants are the ones which life cycle is a single year, which means they germinate, they bloom, they set seed and die back completely for the winter time. And next year they will start again from seeds. Biannual plants are plants that life cycle has two years, which means they will germinate and uh, grow in the first year, but they will only flower in the second year. Now perennial plants are the plants that live more than two years and uh, they will germinate, grow the first year. Some of them will flower first year. Some of them will only flower second or third year as they mature. They also die back for the winter, but they, because they keep their root system alive in the soil, they will have a robust return next year. Uh, our presentation will focus mostly on perennial plants as they are the ones that sometimes you have to wait and sometimes you have to monitor how they grow. I quickly would like to mention the word germination. Germination is the process of the single seed, which is an embryo, emerging uh, uh, little seedlings too. It, germination is very heavily influenced by environmental factors, and that can be seen in many of our gardens. 
it is really influenced by the weather about the oxygen level and the light, the, the temperature of the area of the soil, and also the water, how much water it receives. Next slide, please. When we are talking about establishing a pollinator garden, we are always talking about the first three to five years. And that is because the first year of development in, the, in a pollinator garden is mainly focusing on root development. The above ground vegetative growth remains sometimes slow, and it is most of the time the annual plants that produce the flowers, while perennials sometimes take more time. Of course, as Jeff mentioned to you, um, the first year when we establish a garden, we focus on removing the weeds, removing invasive species. And depending on the garden, really, we see that some gardens has a much more return of the weeds and grasses, and some garden needs some mowing to cut back the fast return, the fast growing grasses. In case you have a garden like this, we suggest to cut it back to uh, six to eight inches tall, but we would like to suggest to be careful with compacting the soil because root development is the most important this time. The second year in perennial gardens, perennial plants is mostly um, called as a foliage growth. Our, our plants will return after the winter and they will have a more robust growth and in this time, you will probably see more flowers coming up during the spring, summer and fall time. This is still a time when we want to focus on the weeds returning into our garden. We want to still reduce the competition until our plants get stronger. So we usually suggest cutting back the weeds to a 10 to 12 inch height. In both years, depending really on your garden, you might be able to do some manual weeding, pulling out the weeds, but we would really suggest caution not to disturb the little plants that are growing, that we are wanting to grow. And Monica, so, um, when you say cut back, you mean like after the dormancy in the fall, right? Uh, no, here I'm talking about cutting back in the spring and the summer the time when the weeds are fast growing and they may compete the, the water supply or the light for our plants. Now in third and four or five years, I would like to mention really cutting or not cutting actually back our flowers for the winter time. So the third year is really the flower production when it's starting. And uh, after our plants flowered and they set their seeds or die back for the winter, it is very important that leave the dead plant material standing. This will supply food for the winter bird residents, but it will also supply uh, overwintering insect habitat with their hollow stems. Many of the caterpillar fall down to the soil and hibernate in the soil. Now I understand that in some areas, for example, I live in a neighborhood where it might be difficult for um, leaving that plant standing throughout the whole winter, but that is our aim. That is the best way to do it. But in case you cannot do, I probably would suggest to cut it back and keep them in a loose bundle upright somewhere in the back of your gar yard. Uh, so the insects will be able to merge, uh, come alive, come back in the spring, in the very first uh, warm spring mornings and spring days when the temperature is above 60. And then after that, you can mulch it, you can compost it, but until then try to keep it as safe as possible. And four or five years, you will see a mature pollinator garden with uh, more butterfly, more insect and uh, more mature, larger plants uh, and higher diversity. Next slide, please. So it is indeed one of the biggest questions that we get is how do I know that my, my garden is successful? 
And um, because very often people come and say, oh, it's just the weeds returning, it's just the grasses returning to the plot, nothing is growing. And I would like to suggest to use a technique that ecologists often use uh, diversity metrics to determine the stability and the health of an ecosystem. We slightly change this because we are not interested in every single species that is growing there, but I call it a target species count which is basically you identify and count the white flowers that you planted that you want to grow and i would suggest to use a unit for this which can be a one yard by one yard or it can be a step by a step and really get down to your plants and look at what you have there and you what you should do is count the number of species in this unit area and count the specimen in this area now, as Jeffrey showed an image before at the Cornelia, former Cornelia Fort Air Park, is the garden may vary in different areas how much growing you get. So I usually suggest to pick three to five sites to have a good overview of the plants you are growing. Next slide, please. Now, uh, I would like to give you some help with how to identify the species that you have and how to count the white flowers growing in your garden. So this, uh, this plot is actually uh, one square yard area from Stratford Stam High School, one of the garden which we considered one of the VDS garden and we were concerned about this garden. So I would say, it is always good to have a book that helps you identifying the species, but now everyone has an iPhone or some kind of phone that you can download an app. It will save a lot of time for you. It will help you and it will provide a lot of information for you. So always try to use an app. And I also suggest to get down really to the plant and touch, use your senses. So for example, in this plot, the first plant I picked is in the little circle. Um, it was a black eyed Susan. And I picked this because it was already getting, bringing the blooms. And uh, my suggestion, when you wanna identify a species, pick one plant, the most abundant one. First of all, with your eyes, check the leaf shape. Is it, is it an oval? Is it linear? Is it oblong? And then you can look at the edges of the leaves. Uh, is it uh, entire or is it toothed or serrate, serrate? But further on, please use your senses, use your touch, touch the leaves. So for example, this is a black eye Susan. It has very soft leaves. So I didn't need it to identify all the black eye Susans. I just went around in my little square to touch all the plants. And with that technique, I could very easily identify that there were more than 12 black eye Susan just in one square yard. Now, other thing that you can do, you can pinch a little bit the leaves. You can identify by the smell or does it have a milky substance coming out? So overall, I would suggest to look at your garden here in just one square yard, I could see a lot of different species, actually more even that is really required in such a small area. Next slide, please. So the, the other question is really when you identified your little white flowers, to weed or not to weed your area? And I think this is the question that comes down to what is the aim of the landowner? What is the aim of the gardener? It's what is your aim personally? Tennessee Environmental Council aims to restore a healthy and balanced ecosystem, which is a habitat for pollinators. So we do not necessarily want to remove all the weeds in our gardens. But of course, if you have a little pollinator garden in your front yard or backyard, and you are aiming to reduce more unwanted plants, then you can do that. I always suggest if you pull the weeds, be very careful uh, not to disturb the root system of the wildflowers. Hey, I, yes. I wanted to add one thing. I, I was out at one of our gardens yesterday and I pulled some, some uh, invasive grass out, a big clump. And at the same time, it pulled out one of the plants that we had put in there from seed. So 
it is it is that's why we don't like to weed in general but yes the personal yes, preference so i'm sorry you may continue thank you uh so reducing competition in the first year important so when the plants are as you said are more developed it's much better not to pull the weeds but maybe just cut back the weeds um also, I want to mention that in a healthy, balanced ecosystem, there is no good or bad actors. Uh, so even the grasses that, for example, are fast growing in the garden, in your front yard or in our pollinator garden, have um, benefits for our garden. You can see it in this picture. Grasses are excellently catching early morning dew. And as the water trickles down to the root system of the grass, it will also feed our black eyed Susan or the cone flowers. Weeds are the name that we call for these plants. Many of the plants that we plant, like the milkweed or the butterfly weed, are called weed, but they are called weed because the first people coming from Europe to America looked to identify these plants, and as they had no agricultural use, they called them weeds. But now we are looking at them as our beautiful wildflowers. Next slide, please. So as, as uh, Jeff said, it is the first and most important thing to remove invasive species as well as you can because they will quickly overtake your garden. Invasive plants are non-native plants that are fast growing and fast spreading and overpopulating natural areas. So always remove those. However, I would like to mention that there are some native plants which might be considered as uh, weeds, like the little black maddock in the same little spot that I was identifying the wildflowers. Black maddock is a native um, plant. It's everywhere in North America. It was actually a food source for Native Americans. And it is a wonderful little yellow flower loved by bees and pollinators. And I just learned that it's an excellent uh, source for honey. So it's a question, we decided to leave it. Is it a good uh, cover, soil cover plant? And our pollinators love it and they will come. The other question is of course, uh, introduced or naturalized species. Uh, you can see on the right hand side, one of our pollinator garden, the berms which we create as erosion control were totally overcome by spreading hedge parsley and also by wild carrots. These plants are not native to Tennessee, not native to United States, but they are not really considered invasive. In the same time, they uh, are loved by pollinators because their humble shape of flower is an excellent landing spot for pollinators and especially butterflies. And it's like a food supermarket for them. So we decided to leave them on the side of our gardens. Next slide, please. Now, this is the time I really wanna mention that all of the seeds that we use in our pollinator gardens are native, Tennessee native wildflowers and keystone plant seeds. So native plants are important because they are the one who evolved in the native environment. They tolerate the local conditions. Most of them are drought tolerant. Usually the root system go much deeper into the soil. That's, that way they help a healthy soil, they stabilize the soil and they manage uh, rainwater runoff. They also important because they evolve together with the native pollinators, the native bees, all the bees that are specialized bees and require uh, special pollens for feeding their young ones. Uh, the other part of native plants are the keystone plants. Uh, keystone plants for pollinators are important because they are critical for the food web and they are critical for the completion of the life cycle of our pollinators. You can see in this picture, I listed some of the keystone plants that support really large numbers of caterpillars, butterflies, and pollinator bees. Next slide, please. Hey, Monica, I wanted to briefly add for our audience that the seed mixes we provide in the Generate Some Buzz program have uh, about 20 to 30 different 
flower and grass, native flowers and grasses that benefit the pollinators. So, um, so there are multiple species in each seed packet. Um, that's why these gardens are quite robust and diverse. Thank you. Yes, that's very important for diversity. So the first uh, plant that I would like to help you with the identification is a keystone plant. Uh, it supports black-eyed Susan, supports 20 butterfly and 29 specialist bees. Um, the leaves of the black-eyed Susans, as I mentioned before, is really soft to touch. This is one of the easiest way, I think, for me to identify is by touching the plant. Uh, they are kind of long lanceolate and prominently veined. The flowers are beautiful black and dark brown central cone that is surrounded with rich yellow petal like rays. Now, this is a perennial plant again. And this is one of the plants that flowers quite early, usually first year. And it will flower through June to September and it loves full sun. Next one, please. So black eye Susan is absolutely loved among bees, honeybees and mason bees. Now honeybees are not native to uh, America, North America. They are introduced for, from Europe, but we have about 139 different native mason bees in North America. M mason bees are small stingless bees and many of them live solitary and they nest in different substrates like in tunnels bored by other beetles. They nest in plant stems. So for example, for them, it is very important to leave the dead plant material in the winter standing. And, um, and they are specialized and evolved together with the native plants. So many mason bees require, and all bees actually require the pollen to feed the young bees. And um, black eyed Susan will invite other pollinators like the red admiral butterfly. But you will see in your garden that it's not only the pollinator that comes to the plant, but their predators too. The little jagged ambush bug, which um, camouflages itself perfectly into this plant will eat and catch uh, small bees and butterflies um, three times its size. So you will see a whole ecosystem evolving in your garden. Next slide, please. Hey, there's another interesting factoid that uh, mason bees and solitary bees, which are native to our region, are 10 times more effective at pollinating than the honeybees. 10 times more effective. So very interesting factoid that the, the native bees are um, really the most important ecologically in our region. Yes, definitely. Thank you. So the next keystone plant that I would like you to introduce you is the Maximilian sunflower. There are several Helianthus uh, species. I'm talking about this one because this is in our seed mix. Um, the leaves are long, narrow, they kind of alternate and a little bit uh, coarse to the touch. Uh, the flowers are bright yellow and they are growing in large number. This plant can go up to, to seven to 10 feet tall. And um, this is, as I said, a keystone plant. It will, it is a host plant for 66 butterfly and 50 bees and it will, flower in, in mid-summer, so mostly July through all the way to October, and it absolutely tolerates drought, so it's perfect for the dry hot days that we are experiencing right now. And I would like you to focus for a second on the leaves, so the leaves are long and narrow. Now please, Jeff, give me the next slide, which is another sunflower. This is the false sunflower. These are simple, they appear opposite and the margins are toothed. This is also, uh, uh, it belongs to another family, the Haliopsis, but the flowers are very similar, bright yellow flowers, and they also grow in large number. This plant grows a little bit smaller and uh, it will flower also from July to August. So if, if you have it in your garden or if it is growing in your new garden, 
It might flower this year, but it will just come. It still need time. And it also loves dry soil. Next slide, please. Now, goldenrod is the number one most important keystone species among uh, herbaceous plants. The goldenrod supports 104 caterpillar and butterfly species, and it also supports 42 bee, different bee pollinators. Uh, the leaves are lens-shaped and finely toothed, and the flower, flowers are really small, but they, they have these elongated clusters. And uh, this plant is very important, not only for, for pollinators, but also it provides food uh, for migrating birds in the, sea, in the fall. It will flower in the late, um, late summer and throughout the fall up to November. Next. Monica, can I say one thing? Yes. Um, a lot of people think that goldenrod causes bad allergies, but the reality is that the goldenrod pollen is so very large and heavy that it, it very rarely becomes airborne and it falls down and it is actually not a problem for people with allergies. So it, it makes a great plant for your yard. Thank you very much for adding that because it's a very important point. Thank you. Uh, yes, next slide, please. Okay, another little yellow flower, Coreopsis. So as the goldenrod was blooming in the fall, Coreopsis is one of the early flowers. It will bloom in April, May to June. Uh, it, when it starts to grow in your garden, it will appear in small clumps. I think that one of the easiest way to identify landslip Coreopsis is by the leaves. Uh, when they are very young, they don't have these leaflets, but as they are growing, they, the leaves will have this deep cut and form these three leaflets. And the flowers are beautiful yellow flowers and it is loved by uh, bees. But here I would like to mention that although this is a perennial plant, sometimes it's not that reliable depending on the soil conditions, but it will self-sow its seeds. Next one, please. Okay, the next one is purple cornflower. And I think this is the plant that um, I heard from most people that their favorite one. And it is indeed a super reliable plant, reliable perennial, returning year after year, producing these wonderful, beautiful uh, lavender flowers. But I would like to mention if you are just starting, this is a plant that grows very slowly in the first year. So to identify the leaves, uh, they are simple, alternate dark green, and they are really rough to touch. And the uh, purple cornflower do not flower in the first year. It will really focus on root development and the foliage. I think for me, it's the third year when I usually get nice flowers. So it requires some patience, but then you will have gorgeous blooms in year two, three, four. Next slide, please. Of course, purple cone flower will attract a lot of bumblebees and, and butterflies. But this is a point I would like to mention because purple cone flower is also loved by finches. And that brings me to the question, as a gardener, do you want to dead head your flowers or you want to leave your plants? Gardeners usually suggest to dead head the flowers, which means you remove, you cut off the stem, the spent flowers, and that will stimulate your perennial to produce more flowers. But if you could just leave some of the seed heads, you will have an absolute joy as the goldfinch male and female come together in a, your yard and they will enjoy your flowers. So it's a question again to gardeners. What is your aim in your garden? Do you want to have uh, a longer flowering season or you want to enjoy diversity in all kinds of animals and plants? Next, next slide, please. Common milkweed, one of the favorite of people and well known to be the important host plant for the uh, butterfly, the monarch butterfly. Um, I think the most important to mention about common milkweed, about identification that the leaves are thick 
can, they are kind of hard and they have a prominent midrib. Also, this is a plant when you pinch the leaves, it will, it will have a milky latex, uh, which contains cardiac glycoside compound. And that is why many butterfly caterpillars don't eat it. But the um, monarch butterfly and the queen butterfly use this plant as a host plant. And this is essential for the caterpillars. Um, this is also important to say that it flowers in June, July, August, and it is an absolute sun loving plant. Um, but it requires some moisture in the soil. And I now mentioned the common milkweed, but there is also the swamp milkweed that is the same host plant, but it prefers really wet soil. It can e even live in small ponds. Next slide, please. And then here are the modern monarch butterfly and the monarch caterpillar. So the caterpillar uses the cardiac glycosate as a as a um, uh, protection against being eaten by birds. It's a toxic uh, chemical, but the butterflies will come to the, the plant and you can see clearing moss and also red milkweed beetle and many, many other pollinators will come to uh, the milkweed. Um, yes, next slide, please. Hey Monica, I want to add there are there will be a time for Q and A at the end. I know some people are starting to put some chat um, comments in the chat, but we will do some Q and A at the end of the presentation. Just FYI. Okay, the next one is the butterfly weed. Uh, butterfly weed loves to be in poor, sandy, and dry soil. So whenever you have a garden which uh, you don't want to water, this is a perfect plan for you. Uh, the leaves are alternating and simple dark green leaves, and it has a stunningly beautiful orange flowers. Uh, the flowers are long lasting and it mainly blooms in May through September and attracts a lot of, lot of butterflies. And that will be seen in the next slide, please. You see um, the butterflies love this plant. This is again a plant that is called weed because that's how it was first identified and classified, but it is a beautiful wildflower and it, and it attracts, for example, the zebra swallowtail butterfly, which is our state butterfly. If you would like to have zebra swallowtail in your garden, I would definitely suggest to plant this plant. Um, but I would also recommend to plant uh, the popo tree because popo tree is the host plant for the caterpillar or zebra swallowtail. And I would love to mention that, that you can get these trees from Tennessee Environmental Council next year in Tennessee Tree Day in March. And you can probably register the end of fall for our program. But um, this plant will in, invite many more uh, butterflies in your garden. I would like to mention the queen butterfly on the right below corner, yes, there, which also um, the host plant, plant for this butterfly is also the milkweed, the previous plant, and which is because this, plant, this butterfly is a close relative to the mono butterfly. Next slide, please. Okay, so one of um, the plant and one of the wildflower, which is very well known and always considered as a common weed is the region or, or common yarrow. Uh, you can see the leaves are very delicate, fern-like, lacy appearance. It has many small leaflets on each side of the midrib. Um, the, the flower itself has these beautiful clusters of small flowers and because of that it is loved for butterflies. It's an easy landing for them and they can enjoy the plant very much. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful nectar source for them. Yes, next slide please. So I would like to, to finish the wildflower identification with this plant, which is 
evening primrose. So evening primrose is a plant which is not a perennial plant, but I kind of expect people to, it is a fast growing plant, but it is a biannual plant. So it means it will only grow leaves and stem in the first year, and then it will die back and after the winter, it will return with a rapid growth and it will produce these beautiful, delicate yellow flowers. And this evening primrose is, um, is an interesting plant because it's not only flowers in the second year, but also it flowers in the late afternoon, evening. And it's a host plant for nocturnal animals like mosses. And the next slide, I would like to show you some of the animals that it will bring into your garden, like the, uh, I think, stunningly beautiful pink primrose moth, which is, again, a nocturnal moth. Uh, the caterpillars will eat the plants and the moth itself will come and, and enjoy the, the flowers. But evening primrose will invite other nocturnal animals like the sphinx or hawk moth. And in the afternoon, it will feed the hummingbirds. Uh, hummingbirds will come to enjoy the nectar of these uh, delicate flowers. This is the moment, although I would like to mention that hummingbirds are not only eating nectars, which is just sugar water, they really require um, insect for their growth and for the muscle development. So they eat a lot of aphids, they eat uh, mosquitoes. And, um, and the other animal that this plant will invite in your garden are the bats, because they will come because of the nocturnal uh, moss. And the bats also eat hundreds of mosquitoes, actually six to 8,000 mosquito insects in one night. Next slide, please. So some of our garden, as Jeff showed to you, are still in early stages and they might not flower yet or they are just heading to have their first flowers, but they are already habitats for many of the caterpillars. And I would like to point out the importance of caterpillars and not to use insecticides in our gardens. Our birds, 90% of the baby birds food are caterpillars. Caterpillars are very nutritious. They are soft. They are full of carotenoids. And carotenoids are very important for vertebrates. It's important for the eyesight. It's important for the colorful feather. It is important for the immune system. And here are some of the birds that uh, if you have these caterpillars in your garden, they will join you. And for example, even the hummingbirds, uh, I would like to mention that it eats a lot of small insects and especially for the babies, it's important for the muscle development and for to able to fly as it flies to have amino acids and proteins in their diet. Our habitats, our pollinator habitats are not only providing insect and food, but we also product, provide uh, protective nesting areas. You can see on the right side, the kill dear mama that Jeffrey made the picture of protecting the little nest that was at the uh, former Cornelia Fort Air Park. And our garden was surrounded by a fence. So it was not cut down in any way. So this little nest was protected from the elements. Next slide, please. And finally, I would like to mention some of the resources that we have. So we always use non-GMO and non-modified plants and seeds. For we always suggest to use native plant seed companies. Our partner is Randstone Native Seeds, and we also order seeds from American Meadows. It is very important if you have the chance to buy your native plants from native nurse plant nurseries. Some of the big companies like um, Home Depot or Loews might have some so-called native plants, but those plants are, so, are cultivars, which means they were modified to have maybe bigger flower or more uh, stronger colors or faster growth. 
And those things, especially the flower modification, the different color can modify the, the pollens, which are the essential uh, feeding source for bees, uh, young bees. And the, it can modify the shape, the size, or the amino acid content of the pollens. So we suggest to try to buy your plants. Uh, in person or online from these companies. There are several listed here in Middle Tennessee. Uh, for the identification of the wildflowers, I think um, it it's saves a lot of time and energy to use uh, I apps, applications from your mobile phones. I use picture this, I find it very reliable source, but there are other sources as well, other applications. Most of them has a limited, just maybe a one month trial period where you can use it for free. And if you like it, then you might need to pay for it. But you, if you don't like it, you can delete it. And I think I that was my last slide, if I'm correct. Yeah, I wanted to just remind everyone that the, all the flowers that Monica shared in her slides there are available in the seed mixes at Generate Some Buzz, as well as a lot of other good information and you can review all the species in each seed mix prior to selecting which one you want. All those buttons are on the tectn.org slash generate some bells. And I would like to just add one more thing that all these seed mixes are prepared that you have a year round flowering because some of the flowers will start early in the spring, some will flower in the summer and there will be flowers uh, wildflowers that will flower in a late fall, providing food before hibernation. So check out our website, tectn.org slash generate some buzz. Get your seeds to sign up. It's not a great time of year to plant. But you can plant them now. It just uh, their, the germination and blooming will happen really late in the season, maybe not even before the frost. So you can start planning for planting, getting your garden ready in the fall as well. Choose your spot. You can dig it, carve it, get the soil in there. Maybe put some plugs from a local nursery in there so you'll get some instant growth. But I do want to say thank you, Monica, for the excellent presentation and the scientific aspects of what we're trying to accomplish here. And if you have a question, well, before we get to Q&A, I did want to say um, one easy way to support this program and the continued work of Tennessee Environmental Council in expanding. We want to double that square footage in the next year. So that's our goal, and you can do it with your help. If you want to just earmark your community rewards points on your Kroger card, if you shop at Kroger, uh, we'll get points and, and actually a donation from Kroger once a quarter. And so it won't cost you anything and it won't even take away your points, but it will add points every time you shop uh, to TEC. So check out um, on TECTN.org slash give for instructions on how to do that. Um, we're not going away yet. Don't leave yet because we're uh, opening it up for question and answer. Gwendolyn Blanton will be facilitating the Q&A portion. And Monica and I are, I'm gonna stop my screen share. Monica and I are here to answer your questions. So Gwen, do you want to go ahead and check out the questions in the Q&A there? Yes, we have a question from someone who says, I did not thin out my seeds, so I have a thicket of evening primrose surrounded with black-eyed Susans. Should I thin out the primrose? And I, I don't actually know if you should or not, but I would look at the way it's growing and just I would start by leaving it there. The black eyed Susan will eventually get pretty tall. So it might actually outgrow it and you'll have those diverse layers. Some things are taller, some things are shorter and they all work together to shade the soil which helps keep the soil cool and also helps retain moisture when it hasn't rained for a while. So I would start by not thinning and just let it go and see what happens and pay attention. If it looks like the primrose is totally crowding out the black eyed Susan, yeah, you might, you might try pulling a couple, but I would start by just watching it and, and letting it see what it wants to do. Unless, do you have something to add to that, Erica? Maybe I, I just mean, don't Monica. know if it's the second year or first year for the evening primrose, because it's a biennial. So after the second year, if it is flowering this year, it will die anyway. 
So next year it will come back from seeds and that might be an easier time to, to remove it if, if it's too much. But I think many of these plants will compete for the sites and you will see who wins. That, that is the natural way actually that sometimes a, a whole head of, of the seed will fall to one spot and the most, the strongest plant will find the more resources. Hey, and I want to jump in. There's one more thing I want to share as well, because I know a lot of you have already planted your gardens, um, but this is a participatory program, as all of our programs are, and we have created a curriculum as well as a guide to not only planting your own garden, um, and that's, that's with this guidebook put, put together by the School for Science and Math at Vanderbilt in partnership with our organization and staff, but we do have a guide for how you can even identify other potential locations in your community at a church, a local business, a park, and how you go through the steps of getting permission and doing uh, spreading this concept all throughout our community. So uh, we want to encourage everyone to do their part. So, but if you want that guidebook, uh, we're pushing, putting the finishing touches on it. Feel free to send an email to, um, through our website and make a request for it. <clears throat> Okay, we have another question uh, from Juliana, and she says, I, th I think she might have audio texted this question in because it, it looks like it's been auto corrected, but I think she's asking, she wants to put wildflowers in a flooding place, a flooding area in, in her yard, and can she do that, or how could she do that, and there are many plants that actually prefer more moisture, so I don't think that any of our seed mixes are specifically designed for the wetter areas, but a lot of times we call it a rain garden. When you put your garden, your wildflower garden in an area that naturally gets more water, whether it's your gutter that just flows to that area or the natural curvature of the land just brings all of your rainwater to that area. There are plenty of plants, the swamp milkweed, yes. Joe pie weed, goldenrod loves, water elderberries love water there are a bunch of plants that that are flowering that are great native plants for our pollinators so yes you can totally do that just takes you'll have to just pick your seed packet and um we are working on getting a wetland packet worked up for our generate some buzz campaign but we haven't gotten there yet and along the same uh line someone did ask a question in the chat if the seeds and the plants that we offer thrive in full sun and the answer is absolutely these plants prefer full sun but they can do i think they need six hours or more of sunlight during the day um, another one another question is i sowed seeds in early june how frequently should i be watering at this point and my answer to that is I would water at least once a week, maybe twice, just because it has been so hot and so dry. And at the point where your seed finally breaks its seed coat and starts to germinate, that is when it is actually very delicate and it needs to have that moisture level so that it can, first it's gonna send a root into the ground and start working on its root system development before it starts sending up plant growth up into the air. So you, you wanna make sure that it is getting some water, especially in this hot, dry time. And I think it's supposed to rain this weekend, but if you haven't watered your plant, your garden yet, I would go ahead and water it. And I'd like to add to that. Um, I am a believer that these are native seeds. They are adapted to our climate. And we selected native seeds for a reason because we don't want people to have to water gardens and um, because it takes time and energy and also it, it robs the plants of going through their natural um, cycles. So if you ever can't water for some reason, they're less adapted. But in FYI, yeah, Gwen, you mentioned it is, and there's rain predicted beginning tomorrow and all next week. So um, I've actually resisted watering the garden I'm looking at right now and it, the plants are wilted but they're they are alive and doing well and flowering and the pollinators are flying around and I've intentionally paid attention to the weather I encourage you to do that as well if it's going to rain in the next few days and all next week I would say just give it a chance and um, but again like Gwen said it depends on when uh, when you planted the seeds if they're still germinating that's a critical time for them to get some moisture 
Yeah. Uh, if I may quickly just mention, if you feel that you are super inspired by this presentation, I would love to ask you to hold your horses and maybe don't start right now your pollinator garden in July, but wait a little bit until the fall or next spring because July is, it can be really hot and starting right now with the germination is tricky and it does require less than, than watering, yes. Maybe start with planning and, and look into our, water, our, our seed packets, which one and which part of your garden you want and just hold your horses for a little longer. And that's another reason we encourage you to plant in the, the fall after things have gone dormant. So first of all, your seeds are not going to germinate in October or November and then die right away because it's, it, it, gets, it starts freezing. If you plant in late November after the first frost, then those seeds will stay dormant all season long. They'll get a lot of moisture all winter long. So you can plant, the ideal time to plant is anytime between the first frost in November all the way through into April, May, and June. And, and then you will, you will have to apply very minimal water to the, to the gardens. In fact, no water because you get rain and snow throughout the, the cold season. And then they come up strong in when they start blooming and sprouting in May, June, July. Okay, we have one more question. Well, we have another question here back from Juliana. She says the area floods when the creek fills from the rains. So we, uh, we will post a list of water loving plants. If you just want it to be a flower garden, a, a pollinator garden, you could, you could just choose rain garden plants, which there are a lot of rain garden plants. And we will post a list on our website if we don't already have one up there. And if you are okay with a bushier type aspect, you could use silky dogwoods. They are great uh, willow trees, which are become a more tree-like thing, but they're very, the native willow, the black willow is one of the most important keystone species, but it is actually more like a tree. So we don't plant it in our flower gardens, in our pollinator gardens, but it is great for edges of creek banks and swamp areas for things. It can totally tolerate being completely inundated. And we have another question here from Tad. Does very high solar radiation have any effect on these plants? And if so, is there anything I can do about it? Um, I would say yeah. that plants evolve to turn the leaves uh, so they know exactly what is the level of solar uh, energy that they need, how much sun they need, and they can turn the leaves in a way that they prefer. Of course, if you, if you see that your plants start to wilt, then um, you might water them. It's really depending on the garden that you have. Is it your little garden in your front yard or is it a bigger uh, area for pollinators and you are unable to, but these plants are native plants and they are, they evolved to the native conditions. Um, now, there's a great question in the chat about um, removing the sod by hand. It is labor intensive, yes. Uh, you can rent a sod cutter from Home Depot or Lowe's and make it a lot easier for yourself. Uh, but the question is, what is your opinion on smothering with cardboard? Yes, that is actually a valid approach. If you have a lot of cardboard and you want to just lay it out on the grass, it'll actually it'll prevent, first of all, it pre prevents the grasses from growing up. They will eventually die. And then if you put soil on top of the cardboard, at least two to three inches, um, then you can plant the seeds on top of that soil, which is on top of the cardboard, which is on top of your sod. It will minimize that weed growth from the bottom and it will allow those seeds um, to grow. And then the other part of the question is about prescribed burning, which it, on larger yeah. plots, that is a valid approach after three to five years, then you can- Yeah, but I think it, it really has to be careful about um, where is your plot, where is your garden. You, I don't think you're allowed to do any burning close to cities or inside cities. Um, yeah, that's a technique for farmland in more, wide yeah. open areas, yeah, out in the countryside. Yes. But it is, it's a valid approach, but you definitely want to make sure you do it with all the uh, local regulations. Um, so we're not going to encourage you to do that unless you're an expert in that area. Now, TWRA, Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, does have expertise in controlled burn. So if 
you want to do that one, I would suggest you definitely contact them first. But again, it's only for really large acre uh, acreages, not uh, not 100 or 200 or 300, even 1,000 or two square feet. Um, yes, you can plant in midsummer. That's the question. But I think we answered that. Why are spring and fall recommended? Because it's cooler. The seeds are not going to germinate, but they will get a lot of rain and moisture all winter long. So they are ready to germinate when nature calls in the spring. Great questions, y'all. Mm -hmm. And feel free, I don't know if uh, you can email tectn.org or you can question, ask questions in the future through our website. Um, and, and join our email list if you haven't already so that we, the next time we do a webinar, you will know when it's coming up. And all that is, you can do all that on our website, tectn.org. I'm going to go ahead and put it in the chat. For those of you. Jeff, there's, there's another question here in the Q&A. Uh, do you recommend placing bee hotels in or near your pollinator gardens? Is this necessary or is it desired? And I think that, that it is nice to have bee hotels, but a lot of people are bringing up the the point you don't want to have a huge hotel it's better to have a much smaller um, hotel for the bees to live in that way if they're attacked by a pest or a predator they don't get all the bees at once and so it, rather than having a large bee hotel it's better to have a bunch of smaller ones and one thing you can do is just by leaving areas of your ground that isn't mowed and that's exactly what a pollinator habitat is it provides an area of the soil for a lot of solitary bees to dig the burrows or to use someone else's burrow that someone else dug and to build their nests in there. So if you wanted to do a combination, if you want to put some bee hotels out, yes, definitely do that, but make sure they're the small ones with just a couple host sites for the bees. And put it to a sunny site. So usually it should face south because that will keep the bees warm throughout the winter time when they are hibernating in it. There's a great question uh, from Marcella that they finally had their yard graded. So I imagine it's a larger area, several thousand square feet, I'm guessing. And there's no sod to remove. That's a great time to plant the seeds, by the way. But if it's right now in the, in the middle of summer, I'd say hold off on planting those seeds until the fall. Uh, do we have any suggestions on how to cover and protect the area until planting? And I think the cardboards are a, are a good suggestions that they can do. Uh, cover it with cardboards that will uh, protect the area from unwanted beads returning. And yeah, erosion. How, how big the area is, because uh, uh, you wouldn't want to have cardboard over a large yard. But if it's a small plot, definitely. And I don't have any good recommendations on what to cover it or protect it with until planting. Um, you could use are, compost. Mm -hmm. There are actually uh, like erosion control matting that is made out of burlap. So it's biodegradable and natural. Um, you would have to spend some money on that, but I, I've seen that at Ace Hardware. And again, it depends on how much area there is. And if you want cardboard or burlap, um, and then Definitely, I would encourage you to add some soil, uh, even even an inch. On the top of the cardboard, it would stabilize the cardboard as well. Or just compost. Mm -hmm. Well, we are over an hour, and I want to say thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, on behalf of Tennessee Environmental Council, thank you. And thank you for planting your gardens and nurturing those habitats, enhancing the biological and ecological health of Tennessee and the world. Uh, every, it makes a difference when you do this and we're pleased to be able to work with you and make sure you post your pictures on the Facebook group if you're on social media, generate some buzz as a Facebook group where we wanna see your photos. And then you can ask questions there. You will definitely get some good answers by participating in that Facebook group. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day and happy summer. Thank you. Thank you.